a human emergency on Florida's shores. Migrants risking everything to live in the U.S. Why do you want to come here? As our waterways see an increase in people making these dangerous journeys to freedom, we're bringing you a first-hand intimate look at the response to these landings. For us, it's a border security mission. And finding out what happens once migrants make it to dry land, even witnessing an emotional reunion. The impacts of this complex issue on our state and the political debates over how to handle the surge of people coming to our country illegally. This is crazy. This is out of control. We can't sustain it. But amid the division, we'll introduce you to Floridians answering the calls to help migrants in local communities. They need support. They need food. They need a work. Nada in Cuba. We're diving into all of this in this Florida 24 Network special, Landing in Florida, the State of Immigration. Welcome to this special presentation on Florida 24 Network. I'm Jennifer Dela Cruz. Immigration is a topic we've been covering extensively in recent months. I'm joined by my colleagues, Katie Legrome, Sophia Hernandez, and Forrest Saunders. More migrants are making the dangerous journey, hoping to reach Florida's shores and search for a better life. And we're highlighting our in-depth reporting from the number of migrants coming into our state to the federal and state responses to these landings. How the topic has become controversial and political. And of course, how it's all impacting you and your family. We're spread out all the way down in South Florida to up here in Tallahassee. We're taking a look at the issues, the solutions, and the possible resources for those that need it. But we want to start with those migrant landings, where they happened, when the surge occurred, and how we got to this point. But before we break down that data, we want to note that these migrants are more than just numbers. These are people who are facing challenging conditions in their home country, and they are looking to build a new life, often with just the clothes on their backs right here in our home state. We share their stories within the next hour. With all that being said, let's walk you through this influx of migrants to our state. As of mid-May for the 2023 fiscal year, which started in October 2022, the U.S. Border Patrol reported more than 83,000 migrant encounters in Florida alone. That's compared to more than 35,000 in 2022, nearly 19,000 in 2021, and more than 15,000 in 2020. In mid-May, Title 42 expired with the possibility of impacting this year's numbers even more in Florida. The national policy put in place in 2020 to curb the spread of COVID-19 gave the U.S. government power to swiftly expel migrants at the southern border. In recent months, we have seen migrant landings stretching from the Florida Keys to the Treasure Coast. In mid-October of last year, we told you about a surge in the Florida Keys. At one point, federal agents reported around a dozen landings in a 24 hour period. In another case, around 300 migrants arrived at Dry Tortugas National Park, causing the park to temporarily close in January. Also during that month, the Coast Guard says dozens of migrants were rescued from a crowded boat off Virginia Key. And sadly, some of these voyages turned deadly. At the beginning of March, the Coast Guard said a Haitian migrant died aboard a Coast Guard cutter after the Coast Guard stopped the boat she was in. And just days later, a crew rescued four migrants from a capsized boat near Juno Beach, including a child. Give, give me the kid. Give me the Stay right here, buddy, okay? According to the U.S. Border Patrol, more than 6,300 migrant children have come to Florida since October 2022. In addition, more than 65 kids have come alone without their parents. Three days back in October 2022, photojournalist Matthew Apthorpe and I were with federal agents around the clock in the Florida Keys as they worked to keep up with a record-breaking number of migrant landings. During that time, we witnessed the very real, very human stories of men and women leaving with nothing but risking everything for a chance at a free life in the U.S. You will see blurred video throughout this special. We've chosen to blur some migrants' faces because while many arrived here illegally, we do not want to bring any additional harm to people whose legal cases may still be playing out or who may be trying to escape violence in their native country. We are, however, showing the faces of the migrants who agreed to speak with us on camera. Take a ride along the Florida Keys and it's clear. 
why this 180 mile stretch of blue water Atlantic coastline is a destination for tourists. But look a little deeper. 220, 120. And this unique arc of islands along the Florida Straits, the southernmost point just 90 miles from Cuba. For us, it's a border security mission. Is also the X that marks the spot for people from other countries willing to make the dangerous voyage on water. They can spend weeks at sea here. With the chance for freedom on land. The dangers is the first thing that stands out. Assistant Chief Patrol Agent Adam Hefner is with U.S. Border Patrol's Florida Sector, where he says the Florida Keys has been dealing with an unusual surge in migrant landings, up 450% from October 2021 to October 2022. This is the most landings that I've seen. Predominantly been Cuban and Haitian migration. In the four days prior to our arrival, Border Patrol had reported 15 separate landings, leaving hundreds of men and women entering the state illegally, often in dangerous homemade rigged out boats like this one. I'm surprised when some of these homemade or makeshift boats do actually even make it. Their arrivals frequently at night, amid cooler temperatures and darker skies. All right, it's just after 2 a.m. Tuesday morning. We just got a call that there are about 25 to 30 migrants who landed on a boat over in Key West. So that's about 50 minutes, maybe a little less because there's no traffic from where we are here in Marathon. So we are gonna head over there now. So many migrants on scene, we're actually gonna bring uh two transport vans so we have space to adequately transport all of them. So here comes our other van right now. How long can you guys sustain this type of activity where it's just constant like this? Tighten things up and work, you know, all of the partners provide some extra support. When we arrive, some of those partners are already on scene. What's up, guys? Fair warning, we have media with us. Along with 25 Cuban men and women, visibly exhausted, some even shoeless, but all of them appearing relieved to be on dry land after they describe three days at sea. Are you happy to be here? ¿Y cómo sientes para estar aquí? Bueno, ¿Estás bien? Bueno, okay. For this 22-year-old who agreed to speak with us on camera, the three-day journey was worth it. She's seeking work to help families Family who couldn't come. What do you want from America? Same for this man, dressed in USA, red, white, and blue. Yeah, yeah. Be able here and help his family and you know, have a better life. He arrived needing medical attention after he says he cut his hand, simply holding on to a boat they could not control. As a matter of fact, unless they were holding on, if they let go of the handle, it would. Um, they were unable to stop it. The boat seen here eventually crashed into a Navy vessel near the base where they all landed. The group says they each paid between two and three thousand U.S. dollars to get here. They'll spend the next 12 to 72 hours getting processed before their release, but kept under federal monitoring as their immigration proceedings officially begin. They join more than 100 additional Cubans who within the same day also made it to shore here. We responded to 11 different migrant landings throughout the Florida Keys. In just 24 hours? In just 24 hours. We're on the water. I was gonna run to the Haitian self freighter real quick. With federal agents. This target at the moment is a little over 16 nautical miles offshore. From air and marine operations. Coming up. A specialized law enforcement division of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Their mission, stop migrants from making it on land in the U.S. illegally. It's getting tough because it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. Freedom-seeking migrants, mostly from Cuba and Haiti, are often willing to do anything and risk everything to get here. I've seen uh, people that have shot themselves. I've seen people that have uh, Try to cut themselves. Marine interdiction agent John Apollody has been patrolling the waterways in the Keys yeah, since 2009. The thought process is if I injure myself uh, enough that they'll have to take me to a hospital. With so much attention focused on the influx of migrants crossing the southwestern border, here in the southeast, here on the ocean, totally different set of problems. It's the most I've seen since I've been here. According to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, more than half of all migrant interdictions at sea in the U.S. are conducted by the Miami Air and Marine Branch, which includes the Florida Keys. In 2022, those units apprehended 139 migrants on water. For comparison, in 2021, 
That number was 54. Does something more need to be done to secure our borders? We have a finite number of agents and assets. So that being said, it, it, does, it get, does get tougher every day with the, the, the more that come, the harder it is on us. To help control the surge, agents from borders around the country are now doing 30 day rotations here. This agent hails from the northern border in Michigan. Plotting a course to a possible target of interest. Stopping people from entering the state illegally on water. 33 and a half nautical miles west of us. Begins with tracking them in the air. Once air crews spot suspicious boats, the Marine team in these high-tech boats move in. It's been almost daily. It doesn't take long to get a new alert. Right now, we know of one rustic vessel and possibly uh, a GoFast vessel. Right here, one for also. GoFast boats like these have long been used to smuggle in desperate migrants. These are just a few images of recent captures and the sometimes dozens of migrants hidden inside. Oh, wow. On this day, their target is some 40 miles southeast of Marathon. This is our first interdiction of the day. As we inch closer, we can see the vessel is homemade, known as rustic for its rickety build, often shoddy mechanics but it's packed with people, mostly men, a few women, all from Cuba. Are they typically so, Yeah, I mean, we've found some that have been, once they run biometrics, that have been into the country before. Sometimes they even have Florida driver's licenses, so they'll make it here, they'll get some kind of status, and then they'll go back for one reason or another. With partners from the U.S. Coast Guard in tow, the group is given life jackets and quickly transferred to a federal vessel. We get the clear, it's safe to approach. How are you? Como estas? They smile, some wave at our cameras, answer our questions, even take out phones to capture the moment. ¿Qué quieres de América? Why do you want to come here? In, in Cuba, nada in Cuba. This group of migrants just told us they've been traveling on the water for eight days to try to make it to America from Cuba because there's nothing in Cuba. And they were just interdicted, which means Coast Guard's going, they're going to load up on the Coast Guard cutter and they're going to be sent back to Cuba. That's the chance they take. A closer look at their wood frame boat. Jugs are for water or fuel. Shows just how risky this week long journey was first interdiction of the day complete. Uh, everybody was safe. That's, that's you know, all you can hope for. And, and on to the next one. And on to the next one. I grew up in South Florida. Watching the news of people coming ashore here isn't anything new. But being on the ground there, quite literally in the middle of those interactions, was a humbling recognition of the humanitarian crisis at play here from the federal agents who don't always know the intent of the people they approach to the exhaustion and pure relief of those who do make it to land. And of course, the frustration and sadness of those who don't and are turned around and sent back from a place they were willing to die to escape. Our special reporting continues after the break. Seeing the desperation and most of all seeing the joy once the family find out they, their family are fine, it's, it's like a fire. Migrants making the dangerous voyage to our state are often leaving behind loved ones with no way to reach out. The way one Floridian is using social media to help give those families some peace of mind. Welcome back. As every day passes, more migrants continue to arrive in the Florida Keys. And for those embarking on these dangerous journeys, their families back home often don't know how they are or if they're safe. Back in January, when we saw a surge in migrant landings in the Dry Tortugas, I spoke to two men who are making it their mission to not only help these migrants, but their families. It's near to me. Alberto Arrego, a journalist with Gubita Now, says for years he has seen families and friends from his hometown of Playa Baracoa make the treacherous journey north to the land of freedom. The people don't have future in Cuba. The, the situation now in Cuba is critical. The people don't have uh, access to medication, food. Uh, it's very expensive. The salary of, of people in Cuba is not enough to cover a month uh, for all the family. And the people don't have uh, another way to, to, to live their life. As Alberto says, those who stay on the island are just trying to sobrevivir or survive, which is why many leave. The problem is their families back home have no information on their loved ones' whereabouts or safety. 
And the other day, I have 88 uh, messages from Cuba from the people. And the people uh, only try to know his family is really okay. They give Alberto names, photos, any information they have. But Alberto, who now lives all the way in Missouri, says it's hard to help. Right now, in Dry Tortuga, uh, for the uh, videos, a few videos, only the work calls pub, uh, have published, uh, you see so many uh, ships in Dry Tortuga, only in Dry Tortuga, and it's impossible now where the ship uh, uh, arrive in the United States. It's why he's relied on Eric Diaz. Seeing the desperation and most of all seeing the joy once the family find out they, their family are fine, it's, it's like a fire. The founder of Barcos por la Libertad, or Boats of Freedom, has been posting pictures of stranded vessels since August of 2022. The Cuban immigrant, who now resides with his family in Key West, says it's in his remote fishing spots where he finds migrants mainly coming from Havana, Matanzas, and Pinar del Rio. There's no signal, and they don't have anywhere to communicate. Sometimes the, if it's a bad weather, the islands are quite far from Key West, and uh, nobody goes there for days. Which is why Diaz has made it his mission to go out and post as much as he can. My hope for this page is to be able to help also those people so to find a way to notify the authority and that there are, you know, people stuck there, be able to notify their family about their situation and the status. Diaz says when he finds a group of migrants, he notifies the Coast Guard or CBP, and the individuals are then taken into custody. He says he only expects the number of arrivals to grow and hopes his one-man operation can keep up with demand. As of March, Eric continues to post on Barcos por la Libertad multiple times a day, and he says whenever he's out on the water, if he happens to see a boat, he says it's the least he can do to try and help. Now I want to send things over to Forrest in Tallahassee. Forrest? Yeah, thanks, Sophia. Immigration has been a hot and at times contentious topic right here at the state capitol, but not just here, up in D.C. as well, as we've seen Governor Ron DeSantis as well as the White House butt heads on the topic. Different policies have been put in place here in Florida to help try and curb some of the immigration issues. So let's walk you through some of the big changes that we've seen over the last few months. In January, in response to the surge of migrants in the Florida Keys, Governor Ron DeSantis signed an executive order activating the National Guard and directing state agencies to provide additional resources there. In February, during a special session, lawmakers passed a controversial new migrant transportation program. It uses $10 million in unspent tax dollars to continue the voluntary relocation of, quote, unauthorized aliens, end quote, from one part of the country to sanctuary destinations. Democrats, they called this plan inhumane. The GOP majority said it's a necessity. It's a continuation of a program that state officials used to fly about 50 Venezuelans from Texas to Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, just last year. The governor has defended those flights, which got national attention as voluntary, helpful, and a spotlight on border security. Now these policies are on the front burner People need to be talking about Biden can't defend his policies of open borders. Uh, it's doing huge damage. The governor's criticism about the president's response to immigration in the U.S. leading to some back and forth with the Biden administration. Let's go back to January. The White House press secretary had this to say. Governor DeSantis has made a mockery of uh, of the system and uh, and he has cons consistently and constantly as many of you have reported uh, has done political stunts has not helped to uh, address the issue but has instead decided to uh, put the lives of migrants who are coming here uh, for a better life at risk now she added that the president has expanded safe orderly legal pathways for migrants and that the white house continues to urge individuals to use those one of those being a parole program. At the beginning of the year, President Joe Biden announced changes to the nation's immigration policy. That includes turning away Cuban, Haitian, Nicaraguan, and Venezuelan migrants who enter the U.S. illegally at the Mexican border. And federal officials said in the weeks following the announcement of new measures, there was a decrease in illegal southwest border crossings. Now back here in Tallahassee, immigration will remain a key issue for the lawmakers in those chambers behind me. If their policy changes, we will keep you updated as things move forward.
As we continue our special, Landing in Florida, the State of Immigration, we're taking a closer look at federal policies and the way different administrations have enforced them in recent years. Welcome back. As immigration continues to be a big issue on both the national and state level, we want to go in depth on U.S. immigration policies. So let's take a look back at federal law and how, if at all, it's changed. Nearly 60 years ago, the U.S. passed the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. It changed the law to give preferred immigration status to those who can improve or help the workforce, or if they had family members here already. But according to Pew Research, the enforcement of certain immigration laws can vary between administrations. One of the biggest differences some experts note is the enforcement of the improper entry into the U.S. It first became a law back in 1929. So how is it enforced differently? Under the Obama administration, the former president started a new policy, Priority Enforcement Program. Instead of targeting anyone who's here illegally, he chose to focus on those who have committed felonies or are considered a danger to society. This memo from Homeland Security was sent to all immigration enforcement branches in 2014. It mentions how limited resources prevent the agencies from responding to all immigration violations or from removing all immigrants who are in the U.S. illegally. It goes on to say that, quote, DHS must exercise prosecutorial discretion in the enforcement of the law. And in the exercise of that discretion, DHS can and should develop smart enforcement priorities and ensure that use of its limited resources is devoted to the pursuit of those priorities. Flash forward to when Donald Trump was president, the administration used no tolerance policies when enforcing the law, which meant who was crossing over and if they were a criminal did not matter. So that's why we saw parents and children being separated. That brings us to today and the Biden administration. We spoke with Scripps News Washington DC correspondent Joe St. George to find out how immigration laws are being implemented and why it can be hard to change immigration policy in the U.S. I think you need to remember uh, that Democrats believe that the only way they are going to get a path to citizenship for dreamers, for DACA recipients, of which there are thousands in the state of Florida and in other states around the country, the only way they're going to get that is by including it in a massive immigration bill that perhaps includes more security measures for the southern border, more protections for Florida to deal with migrants uh, coming coming by, by water, coming by raft in many cases. So Democrats are holding out on putting anything into law until they can get a responsible, reasonable path to citizenship for migrants who are already here. On the other side of the aisle, conservatives are saying very clearly that why should we reward activity that at the time coming into the U.S. was illegal? That's a very conservative position. They believe we need to solve the immigration crisis first. We need to solve the, the influx of migrants at the border uh, seeping through certain areas first, and then we can have a conversation uh, uh, about putting certain individuals on a pathway to citizenship. But that's a big philosophical divide. You have one part Party believing that people who are already here should have a pathway to citizenship and another party who doesn't want to reward illegal activity. Still to come, a closer look at what happens once migrants make it to dry land in the Florida Keys. Plus, yeah. the emotional reunion between two family members from Cuba. Also ahead, as more migrants continue to make their way to our state, the impacts on you, your family, and your kids' classrooms. Welcome back. While I was in the Florida Keys with federal agents, I saw firsthand what happens once migrants make it to dry land by getting access to the U.S. Border Patrol Station. At one point, we even witnessed a family reunion, decades in the making. Outside the U.S. Border Patrol Station in Marathon Key. I'm picking up my nephew. We met Omar Kakachi. How did he get here? He got by the rough. He hasn't seen his nephew in more than 20 years. He called me from this office. Hey, 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 hey uncle, I'm here. Where are you at? I'm here in Marathon. What did you think? I said, oh, my goodness. His nephew, among thousands of Cuban migrants who have landed in the Florida Keys in recent months, 
incidents of people making the dangerous journey by sea and landing on dry ground here illegally increase more than 450% between October 2021 and October 2022. Many of them coming from nearby Haiti and Cuba. No food, no, no power line, no nothing. Nothing. That's no life. Most of them, they say, I'd rather die trying to get to the freedom than still living here in Cuba. It's very sad. It's a dangerous voyage to freedom, overwhelming federal agents across South Florida. It's, it's uh, the heaviest migrant traffic that I've ever encountered. It's been a very busy 24 hours here. We're both for Marathon. For two days, we were granted exclusive access to the round-the-clock battle, from stopping migrants at sea before they land. Why do you want to come here? In, in Cuba, nada in Cuba. To the multi-agency response when they make it to dry ground. 25 migrants appear to all be Cuban. Uh, looks like um, all from Havana, Cuba. In just a 24-hour period, we were there. Border Patrol responded to a dozen different landings throughout the Keys alone. Are you happy to be here? Bueno, no me lo creo. Huh? This 22-year-old woman from Cuba agreed to speak with us on camera and explained she's seeking opportunity and work in America. After three days on the water in this rickety homemade boat with mechanical issues, the people she came with, visibly exhausted, some shoeless, are patted down for drugs, weapons, then loaded into government vans where they'll be taken north to Marathon and processed here at the U.S. Border Patrol's main station in the Keys. It's been nonstop. Every surge has its own challenges. Peter Daniel is the patrol agent in charge. I think we're doing everything we can right now. He grants our cameras limited access inside the station where people who land here illegally are processed. This is the intake area where we make sure that the migrants are properly fitted for clothing that fits them that's dry and clean. Storage bins of non-perishable food and drinks are also on hand. We notice packages of diapers, formula, even car seats. Do you get a lot of babies, a lot of children? We've taken in migrant families before with young, younger children, yes. We walk a little further to what's known as the detention cell area where each person is held in a group holding cell, men and women separated. We weren't allowed to videotape the cells, but migrants can spend up to 72 hours here while they're ID'd, fingerprinted, and background checked. You guys could know within minutes if this person has Absolutely. a nefarious background. Yes, yes ma'am. And what happens if they do? If they do, then the, the processing will take a different turn. Instead of administratively, we'll pursue the, the criminal charge. For migrants who are not sent back to their country immediately, they can be transferred to a federal detention facility or released to family while their legal case moves through the U.S. courts. I lived for, in Cuba for 34 years. I never was free. Which brings us back to Omar. When I put a foot in this country, I feel the freedom right there. Who describes his own perilous trek on water. And we're here in 1994, four people died, two marriages, one, two guy and their wife, and one 10 years old boy. The memory still hard three decades later. They screaming, that was, I don't want to talk about that. That's a nightmare for me. I still have nightmare with that. But today, he says, is a good day. <laughs> wow. I'm very excited, man. Wow. It's so, I'm so emotional. He was like this when I, the last time I saw him. After a few anxious moments, he's big. He spots his nephew. Que te pasa, los ojos? Yeah. Their emotional reunion perhaps best describes the complexities of the nation's current immigration system. The debates. The more that come, the harder it is on us. And what's at stake if nothing. These biker trips are incredibly dangerous. Or everything. These are all human lives. Why do you want to be here in America? Changes. Help his family, his son, his wife. For us, it's a border security mission. And the tears were certainly overflowing between the uncle and his nephew. It really shows why some people may be willing to risk it all to come here to the U.S. Now I want to send things back over to Jennifer. Thank you, Katie. Among the many impacted by the surge in migrants is children in our Florida schools. A system already dealing with crowded classrooms and teacher shortages is now faced with even more students to serve. 
We pulled enrollment data from Monroe, Broward, and Miami-Dade County school districts. Across the board, the number of immigrant students has been steadily increasing over the past few years. We compared enrollment numbers from the current school year with the previous one. As of February 2023, Monroe had 361 foreign-born students enrolled. That's up 63 percent. Broward County has more than 7,700 immigrant students this school year, up nearly 12 percent. But the largest foreign student enrollment is in Miami-Dade, the district welcoming more than 18,000 students this school year, up 35 percent from the year before. It is important to note all three districts had lower immigrant enrollment numbers for the 2020-2021 school year, which could be due to the start of the pandemic. So where exactly are these students coming from? A large majority are from Cuba, Haiti and Venezuela. In January, we spoke with Miami-Dade Superintendent Dr. Jose Dotres about how his district is handling this influx of students. At that point in time, he said the district was in phase one of their student influx plan, spreading students throughout the district and monitoring numbers. This would be phase two. The second level, that's where we would have to possibly open up centers, one in the north, one in the center, and one in the south, in order to be able to adjust where students would be going in case we have some schools that may be overcrowded. Dr. Dolchres says a third phase would be creating one location specifically for migrant students. So how will this new wave of migrants impact Florida schools and the overall cost of living here? We reached out to Professor Guillermo Grenier from FIU's Cuban Research Institute. He's the lead investigator on the FIU Cuba poll and has authored several books on labor and migration. Here's his take. The impact of the immigrants is a symptom of the inadequacies of the school systems to absorb and to, uh, to actually deal with students and teacher ratios, things that are structural in the system. So here we got new immigrants coming in. Yeah, it'll have an impact, but I think it's just um, the, the problems are there be before they got here. Housing has been a hot topic over the past couple of years with limited inventory. Prices have been skyrocketing here, particularly in Florida and particularly in South Florida. So with more people coming in, not only migrants, but people have been coming from other states as well. Yeah. So looking at population changes as a whole, how is our housing market being impacted here? For new immigrants, the, the problem becomes, of course, who can afford a one bedroom for 1800 2000 bucks in, in Miami-Dade County. When they look for jobs and where, the, where they can work and places they can rent, uh, they don't match. They don't match at all. These people will come here as migrants, but they will live here as Floridians. They'll become our neighbors, colleagues with their children in our schools. No matter where you stand on the immigration debate, this new wave of migration will impact nearly every inch of our state for years to come. Just ahead, help from the air. We're going out um, and assisting people who need help. We're taking flight with Miami's Coast Guard, learning about the support the agency is providing as hundreds of migrants continue to arrive in our state. After the break, a first-hand look at the Coast Guard's response. Welcome back. We have shown you various agencies who have been at the helm of rescuing migrants, repatriating them, and providing humanitarian services. I spent a day with Miami's Coast Guard back in February and share how they're assisting by air. These six crew members with Miami's Coast Guard station are preparing for their Friday flight. After speaking with headquarters and partner agencies, they evaluate their route and make sure it's a plan that brings a good search. And then it's time to board this ocean sentry plane and prepare for takeoff. A bumpy ride towards the Florida Straits and we find ourselves with co-pilot Lieutenant Connor Hull. Sometimes their vessels are not seaworthy. They might have broken down and they're in some sort of situation where they need assistance. So we're here. In the air, this crew of six each has an important role to play. So you guys are having some kind of radars up here. There's two guys in the back making a different technology. Tell me kind of what you guys are looking at. Up front, uh, we're flying in the area that needs to be flown using our flight maps and other instruments. Um, and they're the ones that are actively pinging radar targets, putting the camera on to see 
um, who it is. Miles offshore the Florida Straits and in the middle of the Atlantic, boat upon boat was being found by technology special to the Coast Guard. The crew circles the vessel, determines if those on board are in distress, and communicates with other agencies to see how they will help. What is different maybe from when you first started versus now, what you're seeing? The numbers. The numbers are, I think, if you compare last year's to this year's, you know, the numbers have grown significantly. But in terms of the, the voyages themselves and the condition that these people are in, very much the same. And we saw it firsthand, this picture of 21 migrants stranded for eight days without food or water. We're about two hours into the fight with this Coast Guard. We're about nine miles off the shore of Miami near k -Town. You can see that we've already seen a group of migrants. The pilots right now are working to kind of survey where this group is exactly, pinpoint their location, see if they're in need, and survey the area. Circling the Bahama Banks, we find more boats and more signs of landings. I would definitely say uh, I do see a lot more people on islands rather than the boats. Um, I don't know the reason for that. Mission system operators like Raul Tavares are tasked with pinpointing exact locations, inputting them into databases, figuring out next step solutions for rescues. We just wait on the response from our headquarters and depending on the ETA for a rescue plan, uh, from there we decide as a crew if we're going to drop our resources to them. This plane has three options to assist groups they stumble upon. These bags with two rafts and a survival kit, this kit with a water pump for sinking vessels, and what's called AdScan, filled with water, food, blankets. And how do you know when to drop these kits at the proper time? How do you know when to drop them? So it depends on the situation. Uh, so let's say like what we have now, we have about 15, 15 to 20 people. They've probably been there for about a couple of days. So we will drop the, sir, uh, the ad scan because that has, this, uh, that has the water and the food that will help them get to the next day. After circling the area for an hour to find other areas of distress, the plane drops off a saving grace. then connects with those on land via radio. To reach out to them over and over again till we get a hold of them. Uh, nine times out of ten, we, we do. And then we ask them critical questions like, how many people? That's the most important. So when we rescue them, we can have the same number of people. This group was picked up by a Coast Guard cutter from Tampa, thanks to this small plane's intel. In the coming days, these migrants will be transferred to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. Petty Officer Ryan Estrada says it's work they couldn't do without the help of others. The more people see it, they think there's more of it, but it, that may not necessarily be the case. It's just, you know, before it was hard to, it was easy to miss. And now with all the assets and all these partners and everybody being engaged, everybody's, you know, essentially on the same page right now. It just, it makes it that much easier for us to find them. After circling the skies for another four hours, being routed to different areas to provide visuals, the crew finally ends their humanitarian services for the day, knowing their work is essential in saving lives. We're going out. Um, and assisting people who need help. Um, and down here, a lot of the times, it is a migrant venture in a very desperate situation, making a very treacherous journey. Ready to take off to help those on the dangerous journey to freedom. One thing that really stood out to myself and to our team was that SOS message in the sand and the image of people waving their hands for help. And it's really images just like that one that show how risky these voyages can be. The Coast Guard tells me that in a day, they see about three to four images just like that one. Now I want to send things back over to Forrest in Tallahassee. Yes, yeah, Sophia, both federal and local leaders continue to warn migrants just how dangerous these voyages can be. Let's go back to January when the head of Homeland Security was down in Miami and had this to say. The most important message that I can send is for people not to take to the seas. We see too much tragedy, too much loss. During the visit earlier this year, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas touted a parole program for Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans. We're also getting more insight into why people are risking their lives to come to the U.S. Back in July of 2022, we spoke to a Haitian immigrant in South Florida. He told us amid violence in Haiti, more people are making these dangerous journeys. We have violence, we have kidnapping. I definitely do think if I was, if I was still there, not here teaching 
uh, teaching U.S. history, I would be one of the migrants. I would probably be one of the one of the individuals on the boats trying to find a better life. Now, of course, some of these migrants are coming from places like Cuba, and the reasons believed to be political and economic turmoil. Secretary Mayorkas says that the federal government is investigating these root causes of migration. Still to come on landing in Florida, the state of immigration. We see a lot of cases that really, really need, you know, um, support from from not only our agency, but all the all the support they can get from the community. The steps one nonprofit is taking to help migrants and the need they're seeing. With more migrant families coming to our state, the strain is not only felt on migrants and their families and the local communities, but on the organizations that are helping to get them back on their feet. So we want to share the resources available to migrants. I sat down with one of Miami's largest nonprofits back in December of 2022 to see how they are facing this migrant surge. We are always full. This is Carlos Naranjo, a resettlement program manager at Church World Service, a global nonprofit that specifically works to help refugees. But this Miami office is faced with an interesting challenge, a volume never seen before of individuals asking for help. Right now, uh, the numbers just exploded, and I think even the, uh, we, the social services, are kind of like uh, feeling the impact of, of the influx in, in Miami area. Naranjo says the number of Cuban and Haitian migrants knocking on their doors is unparalleled to anything they've experienced before. What was once a team of four social workers has grown to 20 in recent months, meeting clients in the lobby because there's just not enough room. And the reasons for being there are endless. You see everything. Like uh, most of them, they come for um, their their immigration situation. They they want to get a solution, or they have a court pending, and they need you know advice from from our legal department. They need representation. They need to to, to apply or submit um, an asylum application, uh, an employment card application, and you got some of them that are that they're homeless. They're close to be homeless. So when these migrants arrive, the question is, how can they be helped? Naranjo says the first step is orientation. In that orientation, we kind of explain to them all the benefits and uh, let's say all the, um, the options they have in, in the area, like state benefits or programs like matching grant that is an employment program. And uh, based on that, they are referred to, to those uh, uh, options or uh, they are referred to the legal department because many of them, as I said before, they want to adjust status or apply for the employment car. Migrants with CWS are also taught about American culture. They are enrolled in ESOL classes. Children are enrolled in schools. Naranjo also says social services may not feel necessary for everyone, but it's still important to guide them through the difficult process of assimilation and make them feel welcome. They need support, they need uh, food, they need uh, uh, work. We see a lot of cases that really, really need, you know, um, support from from not only our agency but all the all the support they can get from the community. Naranjo says migrants are then paired with the services they need. His agency meets with other organizations that are part of the South Florida Consortium to help find solutions, vet what's not working, and find the best fit for each migrant family. The day I spoke with Carlos, there were about 20 migrants in his front office. And while he says it's not ideal, he says he will continue to meet the need of any migrant who walks through his front door. Thank you for joining us for this Florida 24 Network special, Landing in Florida, the State of Immigration. Migrants have been making the dangerous voyage here, landing on our shores for years now. This is not a new issue. But it's one we expect will continue into the future, so we'll keep bringing you the latest developments as well as any impacts to our state here on the Florida 24 Network. If you have any story ideas or concerns, contact us by scanning the QR code on your screen. It will bring you to our website, florida24network.com. You can watch our ongoing reporting on the Florida 24 Network app. It's available for free on your favorite streaming device. Now we leave you with this. The voices from people at the center of our special presentation. We are not the bad people. We, we want to work here, we want to grow up here, we want to do a family, live the, the American dream. Just seems like, you know, pure desperation, trying to make it to somewhere better than where they're coming from. It's tough. They always ask for war. You're actually legally not allowed to aid them. You're supposed to report them. I have a tough time with that. There's been, like, more repression from the government towards the people. So until we address that, 
that reason that's causing these people to want to flee just to get out, just to breathe. Until we address that, more we'll have more of the same. In, in Cuba, nada in Cuba. To the ones arriving, to fight for this future and don't give up.